In today's video, I'm gonna take you through the equipment, the lighting, the techniques, and the post-production of how I produce macro images like these. Now, I've always been a huge lover of outdoor and wildlife photography, but I'm only a pretty recent convert to macro. In fact, it was fairly recently when I had to do some macro photos on a phone for a feature I was doing for CNET, and I was honestly blown away by this whole other amazing world that's been hidden right under my nose. For this video, I'm taking it a bit further, swapping my phone for my Canon 5D4 and using Canon's 100mm macro lens. So I'm also using these macro extension tubes. Now these are very basic pieces of kit. All they do really is move the lens further away from the camera body and in so doing allow for much closer focusing distances, which is of course exactly what we want with macro. Now, because there's no glass elements inside these things, they're really, really cheap. In fact, this whole set cost me only about 20 quid on Amazon. Now, Canon's 100mm macro lens is pretty pricey, but by using these cheap extension tubes, you can use a much more affordable 50mm macro and still get great results. Once you've got your gear, it's time to find your subjects. And for me, that's been one of the biggest pleasures of experimenting with macro. You really don't have to go far to find amazing things to photograph. In fact, I'm starting quite literally in my own back garden in London. Now I love wildlife, so I intentionally keep my garden looking pretty wild. I'm sure the neighbours aren't too fussed, but it does encourage all kinds of insects and birds and even a family of foxes that come in from time to time and sleep in the long grass. It's really not even a very big space but in macro terms there is an entire world out here. Actually finding your subject takes a keen eye and patience. Looking at a wide scene isn't going to help you. Instead you really need to focus in on searching around small patches, looking at individual leaves and looking out for any signs of movement. Eventually you'll get lucky and find a critter of some kind clinging to a leaf or hiding away in the grass. This odd tower of yellow flowers is regularly full of bees and butterflies for example, but every time I actually walk over to it they of course naturally just scatter everywhere. But I found that by standing here and keeping pretty still, then eventually they realize that I'm not a threat and start to come back and that's when I can get my shots. Even then I find that probably 80% of the insects I find do tend to disappear out of sight long before I'm able to get close enough for a good shot. There's really nothing to do except keep at it. Try to make your movements fairly slow and steady so they're not frightened by the motion. And that's the main reason that I don't shoot with a tripod. Now I've seen a lot of macro tips videos that say that tripods really are essential pieces of kit, but I don't really agree. I found that when I'm shooting, by the time I've found my insect, found the angle that I want, got my tripod all set up and the shot ready to go, that insect has long since buggered off. Instead, I just handhold and I can get my shot far, far quicker. My settings vary, but I usually keep my aperture around f8 for the best sharpness, my ISO at 100, and my shutter speed no lower than 150th of a second. If the sun is bright, I'll up my shutter speed, and if it's cloudy, I can boost my ISO. I also switch quite a lot between auto and manual focusing. Auto focusing does work quite well sometimes if I use the center point and I make sure to keep on refocusing each time I take a shot. When I'm getting in really close, however, I find that the autofocus struggles, so I switch to manual and either carefully use the focus ring or physically move the camera in and out slightly until I get the best focus. 
Just like a portrait of a person, I want the eyes to be in sharp focus, so that's what I aim for when I'm shooting. It can often be difficult to really nail the focus, so I tend to shoot in bursts, making minute adjustments to the focus so that hopefully at least one of the pictures will look spot on when I view them full screen later. Professionals counter this by using a technique called focus stacking, where you take a different photo, a different focus point along the insect, and then combine them all in post so the whole thing is in focus. The problem with that technique is that in order for all the images to stack together, you need A, a tripod, and B, you need to make sure that your subject doesn't move at all while you're taking the pictures. As a result, it's something more often done in studio, as out in the real world, even the slightest of breezes will ruin your shot. And for me, I do just prefer shooting out in nature, and I prefer the look of an image with carefully used depth of field. There are many amazing images of insects you'll find online with that front-to-back sharpness that's been achieved using focus stacking, but I do find with some of those that they can look a little bit more like a scientific record of a creature rather than an artful, beautiful image. And that's the real pleasure in macro for me, seeing this whole other amazing miniature world and capturing these realistic, natural portraits of wildlife. You really don't need to get on a plane to find wildlife, and you don't need to book an expensive safari. You just need to get out into your own back garden. And if you don't have a back garden, then head to any nearby park and start having a rummage around. It's amazing what you can find once you start really looking. Oh, I love coming to the Woodcroft Wild Space in North London as, like my own garden, it is pretty wild and overgrown, so it does attract a lot of different things. But wherever you do go, always make sure you're not doing anything to damage the area. Always stick to pathways and don't go wading into bushes to try and get the shot. Instead, work around what nature has already provided and take the time to find your best shots without disturbing anything. And actually, taking the time is the other hidden benefit of macro photography. Even in a small park like this, in the centre of an urban environment, I have this moment of peacefulness, surrounded only by the grasses, the trees and the flowers. It's an opportunity to slow down, take a breath and really relax. I've honestly found it amazing how getting more into macro like this has really helped calm my anxieties. It feels incredibly therapeutic and I get to come away with some cool images so it really is a win-win. More than that, it's actually given me such an appreciation of what's right here under my feet. I mean, yeah, I knew that there were some birds in my garden and flies, and I always assumed that there were probably various insects, but it wasn't until I actually took the time to really look up close with a macro lens that I realised not only how many different varieties there are, but how amazing and often pretty bizarre a lot of these things look when you actually get up close. And you start to learn some of their behaviours as well. It's amazing to see how carefully some insects take care of their delicate wings to make sure that they're always in top flying condition. Or how a crab spider will sit in wait, its front legs outstretched waiting for a fly to land nearby. And then how quickly it buggers off when an enormous bee shows up instead. Each of these tiny creatures has its own story to tell, and there are endless stories going on at once all around you. And now a word on lighting. There will be many occasions when you're shooting when the ambient light isn't really enough, and you're forced to either slow your shutter speed right down, which isn't ideal, as then you'll get a blurry image, or ramp up your ISO speed. Again, not good, as your images will be full of noise. Under this tunnel of trees, for example, it's pretty gloomy, but rather than using a really high, noisy ISO, I'm using flash to light the insects. I've got a Canon speed light on top, angled straight forward, but to soften that light a bit and keep it looking natural, I've put on this collapsible mini softbox. Now this thing was only about 20 quid, and I think it works wonders for creating a big spread of light. 
So this would be a very, very small light source if you're shooting a portrait of a person, but remember that creating soft light is about the size of your light source relative to the size of your subject. So when I'm shooting very, very tiny subjects like insects, this becomes an absolutely enormous softbox. The equivalent probably of shooting a portrait of a person with a giant 30 foot softbox. I always keep my light in manual mode so I can fine tune depending on the results. I usually start off at 1 8th power and work up and down as needed. Now we've got the shots, let's move over to the post production in Lightroom and see how with just a few small tweaks we can really show off the subjects. So here we are over in Lightroom and I have already picked out three images that I really want to take a closer look at. We'll start off with this shield bug that I found up in Woodcroft Wild Space. Now, as we can see, I've mainly focused on the eye. It's kept um, a good amount of detail on the bug itself. Um, and I like that it's just on this one plant stem and there's very little else going on in the background. It makes a very clean image. Uh, and I'm pretty pleased with this. Um, so let's move over to the develop tab. Running nice and fast on my computer, evidently. And the first thing that I want to do with this shot is crop in a bit. I really want the bug to fill much more of the frame. And I think we'll go something like that, mostly keeping it a little bit more towards the right third of the frame. Let's have a look at that. Okay, actually, I actually think I'm going to move that up slightly. A bit more like that. So it's almost like it's looking into the rest of this dead space, which I think looks pretty nice. Now the white balance on this, um, I actually don't think already is too bad. Um, I think I shot this in JPEG actually, which is why um, I don't have the full raw control. So I don't have a lot of control over the color, but I do want to just drop that tint a little bit more into the greens. And I'm going to bring the temperature down just a little bit to about there already. I think that makes it look a little bit more natural. Okay, now actually moving into the exposure, um, I know that I want to bring the contrast up a tiny little bit just to plus five, give it a bit more punch. The shadows I want to drop. This is going to help darken the background and really kind of isolate the bug. If we bring that shadows right up, you can see it just makes everything flatten out and go very weird. We don't want that. I want to bring it down maybe something around here. And don't worry about this back of it falling into darkness because I'm going to do some selective edits on that in a moment. Uh, and the whites I want to bring up a little bit just to help make it pop that little bit more. Again, if you look before and after, already this is a shot with a lot more punch to it. Now, texture, clarity and dehaze, I don't want to do any of that to the whole image. And instead, what I like to do when I'm really trying to show off a bug or an insect of some kind is use selective adjustments. So I'm going to bring up my brush, make it a little bit smaller. Yeah, it's feathered fully. I'm going to reset all of the settings for now. I'm going to click show mask and I'm just going to paint in the mask mainly over the eyes and the head and anywhere else where there's actual texture going on around to there. I think looks pretty good. I'm going to turn that mask off and this is when I want to play around with the texture more because obviously it's all about the texture on this bug. We've got all these tiny little dimples and if we start to bring that slider up you'll see that those become even more obvious. They really really stand out. If we bring it up and then down you can see there's a huge difference. Now I don't want to leave it at 100. That's obviously too much. I think somewhere around 40 uh, is about right. I'm going to bring the clarity up a little bit. Again, that's just going to help bring out that detail and really punch up the bug. Um, but that's it. I'm not going to do anything with dehaze, but I am going to sharpen it a little bit more just to make it absolutely crystal clear when we finally view it. Now, you can play a little bit with the exposure, but I actually think exposure is already pretty good. Um, on the bug, you could even try turning down those highlights just a little bit, not very much. Minus five, I think, is all it needs. Um, and that's it for, for that edit, but I am just going to add a new brush, and I'm going to brush in just back down here on this very, very dark part, because in bringing the shadows down before on the whole image, this tail section has very much fallen into blackness. 
So what I'm going to do is just bring the exposure up a little bit and then I'm going to bring back that shadow detail to somewhere where it was before because there is a lot of detail in there and I don't want to get rid of that um, and I think that's done a decent job. And If we go back out, yeah already I'm pretty pleased with how that looks. I am just going to change the crop again. I'm going to crop in a little bit closer because I think it can stand it. The detail is there, the resolution certainly there, and I think it's a great looking bug and it should very much be right front and center like that. I think that looks pretty decent. I could also have a little play with uh, a vignette down here just to bring the eye right to the bug in the middle. And I'm pretty happy with that. Only a very few small tweaks, but it very much helps make that bug really pop off the scene. If we have a look before and after, I really like what we've done there. So I'm going to move on. And the next one is this shot of a bee. Now, as you can see, there's a couple of things. One, it's a little bit lost in the frame, and two, it is quite dark, but we can fix both those things. First of all, we're going to crop quite close this time. Now, I really want to get rid of this flower on the left because it isn't really part of the scene, it's just there. So by cropping in closer, we can remove that, bring that nice and close. And again, keeping the bee very much sort of in the left thirds, um, using this negative space to kind of really highlight the bee in the middle. I think I might just lift that up a couple of dots, just to about there, I think looks good. Now again, if I start playing with the shadows, and bring that down, we start to lose too much of a detail around the B. So I'm actually not going to do anything with that. I'm not going to bring it up because, again, I don't really want too much detail in the background on this. I actually want to, I quite like the fact that it's fallen to black. It makes it look like it's a bit of a studio shot. So I'm going to keep shadows at zero. But I'm going to do most of my work on the B again using the brush tool. So I'm going to bring in that brush. I want to see the mask where I'm applying it. We want it around the eye. All the detail on this fur. Smaller size and bring it just down that tongue. Is that? I don't know what you call that. I probably should know. I really wish I knew more about actual different parts of the bug. Oh, I'll just turn that off. There we go. Back on. But we don't want to see the mask. Because I really like this shot, because you see so much of this minute detail of all the pollen that it's been getting all over its face. You see loads of detail in the eye, all these tiny little hairs. So all I want to do is just enhance that a little bit. And I'm going to bring up the exposure, because again, as I said before, it was falling into darkness a little bit. So I want to really make that pop out. And again, we're going to use that texture tool, bring that up to about 40. I'm up in the clarity just a little bit less than I did before, I think just about 10. And I'm going to bring up again a bit of sharpness. Now that's a lot more than I would do to the whole image. If you start applying texture and clarity to absolutely everything in a scene, then you get that very, very crunchy, disgusting, fake look. So I only like to apply that using um, an adjustment brush only in select areas. And certainly for insects and macro, trying to make the eye pop out a little bit more is exactly what you want. So we just take a look at before and after with those changes. You can see how much it's brightened up that bee, how much more of that detail we can see, particularly all of this pollen, it really pops off the page. So already I think that looks a lot better, but I just don't like down in this left hand corner how bright these green stems are. I think it draws the eye away from the scene a little bit and spoils the look. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a gradient brush, gradient filter rather. I'm going to drag that up to about there and I'm going to slowly bring down that exposure just to darken off those stems, really focus the eye on the middle of the scene where the bee is. And I think that's a small tweak, but it really, really makes a huge difference to this scene overall. If we look before and after, we can see how the light has shifted from being very, very dominant down here on these stems to suddenly being very much focused on the bee itself. So moving on to the last image I want to work with, and it's this shot of this long fly, whose name I do not know, perched on uh, on a bit of leaf. 
Now, this is a good example of the depth of field I was talking about when you're using such high magnifications, because this, if we take a look at the info, was shot at f7.1. So normally you'd get a lot of depth of field with 7.1, but because of the magnification, it's focused very much um, on the fly, and instead we get this lovely, out of focus, very orange summery looking background. It looks maybe like a very deep sunset in the distance. This is actually just the side of my shed, but because it's been thrown so much out of focus, you get this lovely orange gradient to it. And I really like that in this scene. Again, I want to do a, a closer crop on this, but I think with this one, I actually want to do a 16-9 crop. I want this to be a longer scene. And I want to put the fly very much over here and really emphasize all of this uh, sunset, in inverted commas, um, over here by using that negative space. I'm actually going to go back in and I'm going to straighten it up as well so it's very much in line with the fly's back, which I think looks a lot better. I'm going to drop it down. There we go. I think that is a much better looking crop. So with this shot, I don't really want to do too many changes. I love the white balance, I love the colours in this, so I don't want to change any of that. And overall, the exposure is pretty good as well. Um, I was using my on-camera flash for this with a softbox. You can tell because we've got this lovely highlight line going all the way along its body. But as before, I just want to help give it that bit more punch. So I'm going to use another adjustment brush. I'm going to take a look at the mask, and we're going to paint that in over the eye over its body and then all the way down this and we can do this fairly roughly I've got auto mask on it does a pretty good job but if it goes over a little bit it doesn't matter so much because I'm not changing anything to do with exposure um, it you're not going to see that odd halo around it this is pretty much only going to be about textures and sharpness I'm going to add a little bit more here on this leaf smaller brush size and just paint up its leg just a touch basically anything that's already in sharp focus I just want to emphasize that a little bit more okay so my mask's in place I'm gonna hide it and in my texture slider again I'm gonna bring that up I'm gonna bring up the clarity and I'm going to bring up the sharpness. And just using those three tools, suddenly this has so much more pop to it. The contrast is there, these vibrant colors. It's pin sharp as well. Um, I just think if we turn that on and off, it really does make such a big difference. But again, because you haven't applied the texture to the whole image, it doesn't look too unnatural. It just emphasizes what's already there. So go and have a look. Yeah, I think it looks pretty good. So just like before, um, I find that these green leaves down here are a little bit too bright, they're a little distracting, but I don't want to bring in a gradient tool, because if I just bring in this big block of darkness, it applies far too much of the background and starts to look a little bit too fake, I'm not really that keen on that. So I'm going to get rid of that, uh, was it that one, there we go, there's two there for some reason. Uh, I'm going to get rid of those and instead I'm going to try and use the HSL tool to selectively change these greens. Um, first of all, I think I actually want to push them into a little bit more of the deeper emerald green colour because over here they're a little bit too yellow and if we take it all the way to its yellowest point you can see all these tones are sort of blend together and all we've got is different shades of yellow and orange and I actually really like that those green leaves stand out so I'm going to boost that a little bit into this much more deeper emerald. Uh, the saturation I'm going to leave but I am going to bring the luminance down and that's just going to help them draw the eye a little bit less. I'm going to bring it down quite a bit at minus 70 which is a lot but I think without that, this is very, very bright, almost as bright as the fly itself. So your eye doesn't really get drawn to the fly in quite the same way. But by bringing down the tones of those greens, it just helps balance the scene a little more and help the eye become drawn to the fly. So 
So that's it for the editing. Um, as I say, I, I don't think this is overdoing the edit too much. For me, these are fairly small tweaks, but they go a huge way to really boosting these insects. They really, really stand out, um, but still keeping them very, very natural, which is the whole point. I like shooting these things in their natural environments, so I don't want to do anything that distracts too much from that. Um, and I'm definitely really pleased with how these shots have come out. So there's some macro. If it wasn't evidently clear, I really, really enjoyed putting this video together. Hopefully you did too. And if you did, then please do make sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button if you don't already, and I will see you next time. Jiggling my leg while I'm doing that. It's probably noticeable.